Welcome to the Parenting in the Digital Age podcast. Many parents are concerned that their child might be falling behind. Others are just looking for ways to help their children thrive, not just in the classroom, but socially and well into their future careers. Each episode, we explore the challenges facing parents in the modern world, from behavior, education, and nutrition, to device and gaming addiction. We interview a range of leaders in the area of childhood development to help you successfully navigate parenting in the digital age. Here is your host, Jamie Buttigieg. Hello, parents, and welcome to Parenting in the Digital Age, the podcast where we delve into the unique challenges and opportunities of raising children in today's fast-paced, tech-driven world. Each episode features conversations with experts and thought leaders who provide actionable insights and practical guidance for navigating life as modern parents. Today, I'm pleased to have Rosemary Gattuso with us. With over 15 years of experience in alternate dispute resolution, specialising in family mediation and restorative justice practices, Rosemary brings a wealth of knowledge on nurturing family dynamics, particularly in times of change. Her approach, deeply rooted in being present, trauma-informed and strength-based, offers a compassionate pathway for families navigating separation or looking to strengthen their bonds. An author, facilitator and trainer, Rosemary merges her expertise in law, neuroscience and trauma with practical strategies for overcoming personal adversity. Her commitment to transforming overthinking into strengths reflection is not only inspiring but incredibly relevant for parents and children alike. So let's explore how Rosemary's insights can empower us to foster resilience, understanding and growth within our families. Rosemary, welcome to the show. In your own words, tell us a bit about what you do and what you are passionate about. Okay. Well, essentially, um, I'm really passionate about just being present with, with people and and also curious about behavior and why people respond in the certain way that they do and that really sparked my um curiosity and uh, i guess my interest um and exploration of behavior um you know overcoming adversity and and why why i noticed uh trends as a as a mediator so Maybe share, we'll start with the mediation piece. So maybe share with us a bit about the foundational principles of family mediation and maybe how they can even be applied within the family home. Yeah, okay. So as a family mediator, so my my role is really to sit with parents and help um, guide their conversations because, and it's, you know, at the point of separation. So it's all post-separation conversations, which are generally about um, parenting, could also be property, but I tend to focus on um, parenting. And so my role is really not to take sides, not to give an opinion or make a judgment. It's uh, just about helping to guide that conversation with a, a real focus on what's in the best interest of the children. And I'm not saying that separating parents can't do that on their own, but sometimes anyone in conflict it can be hard to really distance, you know, yourself from the person that, you know, has harmed you or wronged you or disappointed you in any way or just, you know, things didn't turn out. So so having that third party neutral in the room. And it's quite opposite to the adversarial system because the adversarial system is, you know, us versus them, she did this, he did that, and showing blame Whereas and, and evidence based, whereas mediation is not evidence based. There is evidence there, but really the focus is on the needs of the children. Yeah, yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. What What are some of the more common challenges that families face during separation? And perhaps uh, the second part of the question is how does a child focused approach help them navigate these challenges? Yeah, well, look, one of the biggest challenges at the moment is the financial impact of separation. Um, and I, I feel that it's just gotten worse and worse as, uh, you know, living in, I mean, I'm, I'm in Sydney, so living in Sydney is quite expensive, you know, even other parts of Australia as well. And going through a separation, there's always that financial impact that sometimes the the the, the actual, I don't want to say impact, but, um, the reality of going from a, 
a, a one family unit where everything, all expenses were shared to then being, yep. you know, two separate households um, can really be um, a, a bit of a challenge, you know, and a lot of parents nowadays are opting to stay separated under the same roof. And so that's becoming more common and acceptable. Mm-hmm. I guess the the challenge there is how do you balance the children's needs as well because there's it's like the conflicting needs between an individual and the family. And and that can be often really the seed of a lot of family conflict um and, and disagreement within separation. Because you know, if I'm separating and I now have to maybe work more hours or change my work arrangements to then be able to do pick up and drop off and, and all these things or pay someone to do it, then I have to really focus on me and what I have to do as well. But there's also the family unit and trying to make sure that, you know, all the children are supported and looked after and and it's that continual balance between working to support a family, between, you know, being there to raise the children and in this society more and more um you know that's a really delicate balance yeah it really is um uh you talk in your work about the strengths-based approach to mediation well, what is that well using the stre- the strengths-based approach you can really categorize all thoughts feelings and actions under two options so one option is to focus on what's wrong in the situation and the other option is to focus on what's strong and I guess what I started to see is that you could have um, a mediation in one room with very similar um, circumstances to a mediation in another room but where there's um, the approach whether or not they focused on what's wrong or what's strong could actually um, relay into very different outcomes So two families, very similar um, sort of challenges to look at, but very different outcomes. And, you know, you could see, well, one family in one situation, there was a focus on the weaknesses and what went wrong and the past. So it was hard to really reestablish roles and responsibilities with a future focus, whereas where it was focusing on the strengths. And that also means what's been learnt out of that situation. So it's reframing a mistake to a learning opportunity. And when you look at it that way, then a a mistake where we aren't able to um, extract the learning, then it's a missed learning opportunity. It's not, you know. So, but where families focus more on what's strong, then there was more of a future focus and um, easier to, or, or smoother and even quicker to overcome um, the any hurdles that that were faced and and recalibrate the the roles of everyone in their family. That's interesting, actually, and that that can be quite powerful. Uh, just shifting that view, uh, that one one percent. How, how could maybe me as a parent, or even those in separating situations, use a strengths based approach in everyday family interactions? Do you think that's uh, something the parents could do? Yeah, I think once you start looking at things under either what's wrong and what's strong, then it becomes easier to classify and also to classify what our thoughts, feelings and actions are, um, but also to learn from what we're doing or what we have done. Because, you know, sometimes it's it's almost impossible to just focus on what's uh, strong in a situation the whole time. And that's that's not what I'm suggesting, but if we are able to learn from the times that we haven't, then that will help us change the narrative for the, the next time we are faced with a similar hurdle, then how, how quickly we can overcome that um, can, can increase. And that's the, that's the hope. It's not necessarily about being positive the whole time. It's about learning from when we haven't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that could be cre- incredibly powerful and, and, a good way to model uh, those behaviours that you want your children to adopt as well because I think yeah. it's a a really great view. Uh, in the intro, I talked about restorative justice. Now, I, I, might, I might sound like I'm sitting under a rock here. What What is a restorative justice panel? 
Well, restorative justice is a kind of um, victim offender conference. And so what that means is where there's been, um, you know, situations where a crime has been committed or there's some sort of uh, abuse that, that took place. And, and it's normally in the work that, um, that I do, it's normally with, in, within institutions or organisations. Then restorative justice is an opportunity for whoever was harmed to tell their story, to talk about what happened to them and the impact that that's had on them. And then for a representative of that institution or organisation to hear and respond and potentially apologise. Thank you. That that was more for my own curiosity. Uh, maybe some listeners had had a similar question as well because I mentioned that in the introduction. Um, in your in your experience, how important is the role of understanding trauma in parenting? I think uh, it can really help give more meaning to what we're seeing generally, because and and what I mean by that is that. So I, I see um, trauma or I guess I'm, try- I'm also trying to move away from the word trauma even though I use it <laughs> a lot and talk about being trauma-informed because it's really about um, our behaviour being clues as to our experience. So if you see someone's behaviour, so normally you might say, oh, they've got a behavioural issue or there's something odd or they're a bit quirky or whatever, you know, then or they've got a diagnosis. So then this is, you know, being trauma-informed is about then being curious about what that show, what that behaviour actually shows about their experience. And the thing is, as, you know, parents come in with their own experience as well so it's also about being um, aware and mindful of how our own experience impacts how we respond to the world as well and and of course that that includes um, parenting so and if you merge uh, you know sort of being trauma informed in the parenting um, situation then I would be encouraging a strengths-based approach and one way that I try to explain the strengths-based uh, approach is if we look at, um, you know, a um, participation certificate in schools. I know that there's been a lot of, you know, people for and against it and, and question it, but really, you know, you have a participation certificate which focuses on that individual because that individual didn't have to participate but they did. So that's really acknowledging, you know, what their story and their, you know, where what they have done. Whereas a merit-based um, certificate, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but if you look at this as just for example, merit-based, it compares an individual to others, and the the starting point is someone else, or you know, you got this out of a hundred, and there are other people who got more, and so that I guess that's the implication as well, and and it's can also be more likely to highlight the weaknesses. You got this, but you didn't get that. So that's a very, very basic way that I kind of explain strengths-based because it really focuses on the the uniqueness of that individual. Because often in parenting, when you look at, um, you know, types of parenting that aren't strengths-based, they tend to have a comparison, whether or not it's direct or indirect, but it's it's implied that there's something wrong because this is the right way. And I'm, that's, uh, you know, very, very general. Um, but, I mean, even if you go to uh, a Saturday morning um, soccer game and you hear the comments that parents are making, sometimes they're not very strengths-based. Like, <laughs> you know, it's just very, you know, I, I guess that there's, there's opportunities to use strengths base and maybe there's opportunities where you know more sort of traditional discipline and ways that you know you you know your children you're the you're the expert in your children so keep that on you know take that on board but if you have a sensitive child and when I say sensitive child I mean either they're sensitive because they're responding to their environment that has taught them to be sensitive or they're sensitive because biologically you know about a quarter of 
the, the population have this sensitivity to that are going to be more aware and in tune to their outside. But regardless of what type of sensitivity they have, if you have a sensitive child, then they're going to respond more to a strengths-based approach. You know, and they're all at the same time, they're going to respond more to a, 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 an approach that doesn't stroke, focus on their strength, that focuses on their weakness, and that's going to be a lot heavier for them. Yeah, yeah. Interesting view. Uh, look, I, I completely agree with the strength-based approach. I think I'll be controversial and say I'm definitely against participation certificates. That's but I, l- l- let, me, let me just clarify that. I think that's because uh, I'll, I'll use our own classrooms as context. I think if we give participation certificates, it's because perhaps we're lazy and we're not looking for the merit or the achievement because every child achieves. Yeah. Right? And in our classrooms, we have, uh, you know, you walk into a class, there might be 10 or 20 students all working on their own project at their own pace, experiencing their own version of success. And it's up to that adult, that coach, that mentor, that facilitator, that educator to, to really look for the achievements of every child and reward and recognise that achievement. We're not comparing to others. We don't compare yeah. in a classroom, uh, but we also don't reward them just for turning up. Um, so it's maybe maybe that's a middle ground or a safe middle ground, but I think yeah. as adults we can look for and praise and reward and recognise the behaviours or the achievements that each child gives. I don't know if I articulated yeah. that quite the right way. No, but that, uh, that makes sense. And essentially it's really about putting the focus on the individual. Yeah. And if, you know, there was time and resources to then have a participation certificate that actually highlighted the individual strength, then that would just take it to a next level. And I think, yeah. well, I, I, look, I can't speak for every context and every sporting event and whatever. Yeah. Sometimes there are a lot of kids, but uh, I know we certainly do it. And, uh, you know, it, it, we, we make it a point in every single class to find something that even if one student just helped another student, you know, we praise their leadership, you know, or their yeah. uh, mentorship skills or their kindness and, and those values and behaviours that, you know, create great citizens and leaders. Anyway, let's not get off track. Um, you wrote a book and it's like literally fresh off the press. It's not even off the press yet. There's an e-book that's just come out. It's called It's Not You, It's Me, The Chronic Overthinker's Guide to Self-Reflection. And it, it merges a lot of your experience in law, family therapy, neuroscience. Tell us a bit about what inspired the book. Uh, well, tell us a bit about what the book's about yeah. and uh, maybe what inspired that. Yeah. Well, it, essentially it's about my observations as a mediator of how people manage adversity and the trends that I noticed. And then um, I propose a strengths-based tool for self-reflection. And, you know, if you look at um, self-reflection and overthinking, they're almost the same. Well, they are. They're both an analysis of a situation, except when we're on the overthinking side, we're analyzing a situation through the what's wrong lens. Whereas self-reflection is an analysis of a situation that focuses on what's strong. So if you can do one, you can do the other. So it's about ways to um, rewrite that narrative, change that um, that lens. And, you know, as I said in, in the beginning, that because I noticed that mediations with very similar circumstances could often have very different um, outcomes and it was really based on the lens of the individuals rather than the, you know the facts so and that that's what I was interested in and really wrote about and reflected on you know the 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 trends and the lenses rather than the facts the facts weren't you know weren't weren't as as relevant as really the what what was being reflected in outcomes yeah, yeah. So how can children benefit from self-reflection, especially in maybe managing personal adversity? Yeah, well, I think uh, nowadays there's um, a lot of external stimulus for children uh, that can really highlight what's wrong for them. So any way that they can flip that narrative so that they can see the strengths in themselves can then build on their sense of self. And what what I noticed, and in this this point is really really came out of my observations of um, children during the lockdown who were at those toddler age that that are now maybe in kindergarten, year one, year two, that they were at these prime stages of development and social interaction at home 
well without having interactions with others. And for me, it really highlighted uh, the importance of um, interactions with ourselves and interactions with others that focus on what's strong as a way of building our sense of self. And if we don't have enough of both or these interactions tend to focus on what's wrong, then that takes away from our sense of self. And then that impacts our, you know, resilience. How can we overcome adversity if we don't believe in ourselves and we've got evidence of why other people don't believe in ourselves and that feedback feeds back into our self-talk. Um, so it's all about the quality of our thoughts and, and trying to help support children into seeing what's strong in themselves and to then feed back into their sense of self. And, I, you know, I see the sense of self as how much they can believe in, in themselves. And, and, you know, this is something that's really important because you're often, you know, you're in a situation where others around you give you evidence and or tell you or show you why they don't believe in you or what you're doing or they don't get it. But if you have a strong sense of self, then it's not going to impact you as much. So important. It's critical. It's it's critical. Yeah. Um, so in a practical sense, so because the, they're all good questions, mm. how as a parent can I help my child self-reflect? Like where do I start? Yeah. Well, I think the first per, the first place to start is with yourself as an individual because it's much easier to use the strengths-based approach um, with others if you're using it with yourself. Okay. So I, I think that that is critical and even just being aware of situations, reflecting on because sometimes there might be a situation that just goes over in your head and thinking, oh, did I do the right thing? Should I have done that? Or you remember a response, you know, that happened and it might have been a year ago or more you know, your a child's response and thinking, oh, that really stayed with me. Well, maybe, you know, don't overthink it, but what are the lessons from that? And sometimes even thinking about how that could have, it could have played out with a what strong lens can, can help for future. But, mm. you know, that ability to then reflect on and categorise what's wrong and what's strong because it's so it's almost a reflex sometimes to focus on what's wrong because we're, you know, biologically primed to focus on what's wrong. And sometimes our upbringing gave us an extra added layer of focusing on what's wrong. So it's about undoing all those things. So we really need to, you know, not be hard on ourselves, but just look at every opportunity as a learning opportunity. And, you know, that might also include um, seeking help from others you know, that that can help um, or just forgiving yourself as well is really important and forgiving maybe your parents because everyone just does what they were taught to do yeah. and, and if, if your starting point is they're doing the best that they can or well, they did the best that they can and I'm doing the best that I can, then, you know, how what can I learn from that? Everything, every day is school, <laughs> you know, that's um, the summary, I guess. Yeah, and and really acknowledging the, the little things that children do as well um, can be a starting point. The simple things that are easier to actually see what's strong because sometimes it's harder to articulate the strengths in a tricky situation or a situation that you're not so happy with or you don't you can't see you know you can't see any good in it but start small yeah yeah so important and and it's also in my views it's about defining or at least asking the question who do i want to become what what how do i want to show up you know to my children or to my wife or to my colleagues and and you know it, it, not just asking those questions, but writing those things down and, and saying, what does that look like? Or what, what behaviours do I need to have? What do I need to learn? Like, what, what don't I know? Uh, sometimes they're, they're difficult things to answer. Um, you do a lot of workshops and sessions in schools, I think businesses. Um, yeah. What 
things have you found resonate with um, adolescents or parents? Like do they during these workshops, do they have any particular aha or defining moments? I think um, a lot of the times even just using the categories of what's wrong and what's strong can, can really resonate with people because the more it sits with you, the more you can see it in everyday situations. And I also use a lot of um, a lot of reflection tasks that really help to draw out what's wrong and what's strong in situations and, and give um, ideas of how to rewrite it and how to be aware um, of our thoughts, feelings and actions in, in those um, moments. So, you know, even the reflection tasks, which they're, they're all from my book, um, they can really help in a very, I'll say, simple way um, to actually write down, or you don't have to write it down, but process, you know, the the this idea of rewriting the narrative to a strengths-based approach and how to do that, what it looks like, um, and how to to even just reflect on it because it's also that reflection is valuable. Yeah, very much so. One question I, I do like to ask uh, um, many of our guests is, what advice do you have for parents in moderating their children's screen time uh, and maybe encouraging good online experiences? But uh, as parents, we're all struggling. Well, I think many of us are struggling. Uh, I can't speak for all parents uh, in managing uh, our children's screen time. And um, uh, what advice do you have in, in that yeah. perspective? Look, it's it's a, it's a challenging one because sometimes, you know, you need that screen time for the kids so you can get things done because it's you know that's the reality otherwise it's it's hard to be there all the time engaging I mean depending on the age as well so um yeah it's a tricky one I think um and it can feed into the sense of self as well because if you look at this, you know, as I said, the sense of self is about the quality of our interaction, the interactions we have with ourselves and with others. So if the other or the others is a device, then if you look at it that way, then that can help um, filter what's on the device because not, I mean, not all screen time is bad. So, you know, that can help. Um and then also, well, if it's about interactions with others, well, and and others includes situations and, and devices, well, then um, what's the mix of others as well? Is it okay? There's screen time. There's the neighbour. There's you know after um, you know some music lesson or sport, interact family and 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 thing. So I guess it just comes down to balance. This is the way that our life is now. We we're not going to go back. We don't um, necessarily have enough research to actually to say you should do this or you should do that. Um, but I guess balance because if you look at it as this is helping or, or interactions with others feed my child's self-esteem, uh, is their self-esteem solely being built on or mainly being built on interactions on a screen? And what's the quality of those? In, you know, a lot of depending on the age and what they're watching, I mean, if you have a teenager watching social media, then a lot of it focuses on what's wrong or what you should aspire to, and the implication is I don't have that. So it's something's wrong with me because yeah. I don't have that or I have to do that because, you know, and it takes away from the individual strengths and uniqueness and, and goals. So that's where um, it, it can be a challenge. Yeah, yeah, most certainly. Uh, a fun question we like to uh, uh, start to wrap up the podcast with, and that is if you had a time machine, Rosemary, and you could go back to your, let's say, 12-year-old younger self, what is one piece of advice you'd give to the young Rosemary? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I would probably say just not to worry, you know, to worry less and not to worry about what other people think or what other people say. Or do just focus. That, that, it's so important, and, and that's one of the things. It just comes with age, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think even if I heard that as my twelve-year-old self, that's what I'd tell myself. Yeah. But I, I think that it's it's almost a, a coming of age thing. I, I don't know. Yeah. I think so, and a lot of our the way that you know we're we're taught about things 
lean us towards aspiring to others and looking for others and comparing ourselves. So, yeah, very very wise words indeed. Um, now, your book, uh, your book, it's not uh, it's not you, it's me. The Chronic Overthinker's Guide to Self Reflection. Tell us where can we find that and um, and maybe where our listeners can reach out with you or connect with you in the uh, world of the internet. Yeah, probably the best place is to go on my website and I've got all all the links. You know, it's on Amazon, Booktopia, um, Apple Books, all the, the standard, um, uh, you know, places to find books and, and some stores as well. Super. We'll put the links to the website down below. Rosemary, thanks for your time today. Thanks for your generosity, uh, and uh, thanks for your short. Thanks for your um, thoughts on the strengths-based approach and uh, uh, mediation. Very, very important uh, takeaways there. I certainly got a lot out of today's podcast, and I know our listeners will too. Um, thanks again for your time. We look forward to hosting you again some other time. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Cheers. Bye for now. Bye. If you enjoyed the show, please connect with Jamie on LinkedIn or Instagram. You'll find links in the podcast description. Parenting in the Digital Age is sponsored by Skill Samurai, coding and STEM academy for kids. Skill Samurai offers after-school coding classes and holiday programs to help kids thrive academically and socially while preparing them for the careers of the future. Visit skillsamurai.com.au.